SpaceX sets a date for Starship's next flight, NASA graduates a new class of astronauts, and a new crew just arrived at the ISS. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 8th of March, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Let's start off by taking a look at this week in launches. This week we had three Falcon 9 launches in quick succession, the first of which was Crew-8, the latest crew rotation mission to the International Space Station. Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon Endeavour lifted off on March 4th at 3.53 UTC from Launch Complex 39A. The four crew members on board for this mission were Commander Matthew Dominic, Pilot Michael Barrett, Mission Specialist Jeanette Epps, all three NASA astronauts, and Mission Specialist Alexander Grabenkin, a Roscosmos cosmonaut. Michael Barrett was flying for a third time on this mission after having flown previously on the Soyuz TMA-14 and STS-133 missions. The rest were all rookies and therefore flying for their first time. After a roughly one-day trip to the station, Endeavour docked to the ISS front docking port on March 5th at 7.28 UTC, kicking off a six-month stay on the orbiting laboratory. Endeavour, with serial number C206, was flying for a fifth time on this mission, breaking the record for most missions flown by a Dragon capsule. The capsule first flew on the historic Demo-2 mission and has accumulated the most time in space by any Dragon spacecraft. With the crew of Crew-8 now on board, Andreas Mogensen will hand over the command of the ISS on March 10th before he and his crewmates return to Earth on the Crew Dragon Endurance. One Alpha! One Bravo! In back ignition. Two Alpha! Get in! While Endeavour was on its way to the ISS, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 carrying the company's 10th transporter rideshare mission. Liftoff took place on March 4th at 2205 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in California. The Transporter 10 mission was carrying 53 payloads into a sun-synchronous orbit. As is usual for transporter missions, these payloads were spread out over a number of different spacecraft, orbital tugs, and hosted payloads. Obviously, it would take a while to go over all of the payloads here, so for a more in-depth look at those, you can check out the launch article on our news site written by NSF writer Danny Lentz. For this mission, Falcon 9 had to perform multiple on-orbit maneuvers, and for that reason, the second stage carried a gray band on the RP-1 tank to keep it warm for its extended stay in space. As for the first stage, B-1081, it was flying for a fifth time, the first four missions of which were flown from Florida. It successfully returned back for an epic landing back on land at Landing Zone 4, just next to where it launched from. And of course, it wouldn't be a normal week without a Starlink launch. Liftoff of the third Falcon 9 of the day took place on March 4th at 2356 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission was carrying a batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The mission occurred right as the second stage for Transporter 10 was still in orbit deploying payloads and Dragon Endeavour was catching up to the ISS. It broke the record for shortest time between two launches by SpaceX at 1 hour and 51 minutes, but it also broke the record for shortest time across three launches, with all of them happening in the span of 20 hours. Now these records aren't broken a lot, but it was another push in the drive for SpaceX to demonstrate a faster cadence of flights, something that'll only increase more and more in the future. And of course, the booster for this mission, B-1073, was flight proven, flying for its 13th time. It successfully returned to Earth and landed on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. With this Starlink mission, SpaceX has launched a total of 5,942 Starlink satellites into orbit, of which 394 have re-entered and 5,128 have moved into their operational orbit. Mark your calendars, March 14th is the date that SpaceX has chosen for the next flight of its Starship rocket, that shiny stainless steel vehicle that a lot of you sure do love. The company announced this days after it finally completed a launch rehearsal of Ship 28 and Booster 10, the vehicles that are slated to fly on the upcoming flight. SpaceX had tried twice to accomplish this back in February, but both attempts were aborted shortly after propellant load began. This time around, though, everything went as expected, and we got to see a fully frosty, full-stack Starship once more. After several upgrades to the ground systems, SpaceX was able to put these through the test, showing a much faster propellant load sequence this time around. While during Starship's first and second flights, the propellant sequence took approximately 90 minutes, it took only about 50 minutes on Sunday's launch rehearsal, substantially reducing the amount of time that it takes to load the vehicles. 
This faster propellant load sequence not only makes operations quicker, but by doing so, the propellant doesn't warm up as much and it can be kept at cold temperatures for longer. With lower temperatures, that means higher density and therefore more propellant that can fit into the tanks, leading to an increased performance. Now this is essentially what SpaceX already does with Falcon 9, where it takes about 35 minutes to fully load the rocket. But Starship is much, much, much bigger. Starship's propellant capacity is about the equivalent of 10 Falcon 9 rockets, yet it only takes slightly longer than Falcon to get it loaded. Very impressive. Along with the release of the launch date, SpaceX also updated its website with information for the mission, including timeline and goals. Now, we're already working on dedicated videos that'll go way in depth into all of this information, so look out for those when they're released. But to summarize, apart from the faster propellant load sequence, it'll look very similar prior to flight. After liftoff, the ascent will also look similar, with the ship reaching its target trajectory about eight and a half minutes after launch. However, this is where the similarities end. While for flights one and two, the goal for the ship was just coasting in space and attempting re-entry, for this flight, SpaceX intends to perform three different tests. This flight is the first one featuring a payload bay door that's not welded shut, so the opening and closing of it will be tested during Ship 28's coast through space. Ship 28 will also attempt an experimental propellant transfer demonstration to test cryogenic fluid management in microgravity at a larger scale. This test is part of a contract, NASA's Tipping Point program. It'll see Ship 28 transferring about 10 tons of cryogenic propellant from one of its header tanks down to the corresponding main tank. Additionally, the ship will perform an in-space burn to simulate a deorbit burn, but without being in actual orbit. This is why this time around the ship will re-enter over the Indian Ocean instead of the Pacific Ocean, another difference for this flight. SpaceX claims, quote, the new flight path enables us to attempt new techniques like in-space engine burns while maximizing public safety. While this March 14th target is in place, this launch is still pending regulatory approval from the FAA. SpaceX is currently awaiting the modification of the Starship launch license to include this next flight and its new flight profile as well. So this could delay the launch, but it doesn't seem like it would be by a lot, considering SpaceX normally doesn't do these announcements unless it thinks the launch license is close. Plus, we're already seeing local notice to mariners issued for the Gulf of Mexico, a notice to air missions for the Indian Ocean, and another one of those as well for launch on Mexican airspace. More recently, we've also seen road closures posted by Cameron County for flight. With enough luck, by this time next week, we'll already have seen the next Starship rocket launch, and we'll be starting to think about Flight 4. P.S. SpaceX is also starting to think about Flight 4. They're already testing the ship for that mission. A brand new class of astronauts is now eligible for mission assignments after graduating from the ASCAN, astronaut candidate, phase. Not only that, but NASA has also put in a help wanted ad for new astronauts. This graduating class of ASCANs was chosen in 2021 and they're now eligible to be assigned to ISS, Artemis, or future commercial space station missions after two years of basic training. This training involved spacewalking, learning the space station systems, robotics training, and other spaceflight skills. 10 astronauts are now eligible to fly aboard NASA missions. These are Nicole Ayers of Colorado Springs, Colorado, U.S. Air Force major and decorated combat pilot, one of the few women to be qualified as an F-22 pilot, Marcos Barrios of Guaynabo, Puerto Rico, U.S. Air Force Air National Guard major, like Nicole, a decorated combat pilot, HH-60G search and rescue pilot, Chris Birch of Gilbert, Arizona, a biochemist, science consultant for startup companies, and Olympian in cycling, Denise Burnham of Wasilla, Alaska, a lieutenant, U.S. Naval Reserve, and pilot and energy industry engineer and manager, Luke Delaney of DeBerry, Florida, a retired U.S. Marine Corps major, decorated combat pilot, test pilot, and a research pilot for NASA, Andre Douglas of Chesapeake, Virginia, who served in the U.S. Coast Guard and was a systems engineer at Johns Hopkins University Applied Planetary Laboratory, which manages some space missions. Jack Hathaway of South Windsor, Connecticut, commander, U.S. Navy, decorated combat pilot and test pilot, a naval aviator who's flown from aircraft carriers. Anil Menon of Minneapolis, Minnesota, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, physician and flight surgeon for NASA and the U.S. Air Force, and a pilot who's logged 100 sorties in the F-15 Eagle. He also worked previously at SpaceX, working on the company's human spaceflight programs. His wife, Anna Menon, is set to fly as a SpaceX astronaut on the Polaris Dawn mission later this year, too. Chris Williams of Potomac, Maryland, astrophysicist and medical physicist with a PhD, 
and Jessica Whitner of Clovis, California, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy, Naval Aviator, and F-18 pilot, and a test pilot. The United Arab Emirates also sent two candidates who trained with this class and graduated. They are Nora al Matrushi and Mohammed al Mullah. They could join in the footsteps of Haza al-Mansouri and Sultan al-Nayadi, who were the first Emiratis in space. Al-Mansouri spent eight days aboard the ISS in September of 2019, flying up on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Al-Nayadi was a member of the Crew-6 mission and became the first Arab to fly a long-duration space mission. Applications for a new round of astronauts are open until April 4th, and while the requirements are very extensive, we wish best of luck to everyone who tries. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Blue Origin has completed testing with its New Glenn Pathfinder vehicle. The company has been testing this vehicle over the last couple of weeks, loading liquid nitrogen on the first stage in different phases. With New Glenn now rolling back to the hangar, we're now awaiting its next steps. We expect Blue Origin to move into static fire testing, which the company hopes to perform closer to the summer. Blue hopes to fly the rocket by the end of the third quarter of this year, with another launch planned for the fourth quarter. This follows right after the company disclosed in an interview with CBS's 60 Minutes that it intends to land on the moon a prototype of its Blue Moon Lunar Lander within 12 to 16 months. So we'll definitely keep an eye on what happens, and good luck, Blue Origin! After $2 billion and eight years of development, NASA has had to pull the plug on one of its technology development missions. This week, NASA canceled a long-awaited project that was set to demonstrate orbital refueling and other spaceflight technologies. In 2016, NASA started the Restore-L project, which was slated to refuel a government satellite, Landsat 7, that was not originally designed to be serviced in orbit. In 2020, the original launch date for the spacecraft, Restore-L was renamed to On-Orbit Servicing Assembly and Manufacturing 1, or OSAM-1. And in early 2022, the project finally passed its critical design review. However, its launch had slipped to no earlier than 2025 and then to 2026, so it really wasn't having a great run. Prime contractor Maxar Technologies came in for strong criticism for its performance on the project, which was to demonstrate not only in-orbit refueling, but also autonomous rendezvous and the spider robot, which would assemble a large antenna in space. After an independent project review, the writing was on the wall, and NASA discontinued the project on March 1st. The press release cited it suffered, quote, continued technical, cost, and schedule challenges. And, as we've seen in recent times with companies like Northrop Grumman, the community has shifted towards independent spacecraft that, instead of refueling, dock to the main spacecraft and serve as its new propulsion system. In more space drama, it appears that Terran Orbital is about to be acquired by none other than Lockheed Martin. On March 1st, Lockheed Martin submitted a nearly $600 million bid to acquire Terran Orbital. The company, formerly known as its subsidiary Tyvek Nano Satellite Systems, is a satellite constellation service that manufactures customizable satellite buses, plans the launch of the satellites, and controls mission operations. Terran Orbital is also known for being the manufacturer of the Capstone Lunar Orbiter, which was launched in 2022. The company went public that same year, and it also had already worked in the past with Lockheed Martin, which held about a 30% stake in Terran Orbital and a long backlog of contracts. Lockheed has been the largest revenue-generating customer, with 81% of Terran Orbital's backlog going strictly to Lockheed Martin satellites. Even with all of this, Terran Orbital has yet to comment publicly on the offer, and we'll see what happens. But it is interesting to see these new acquisitions happening in the industry. Australia is unveiling its first-ever orbital launch facility with the Bowen Orbital Spaceport in northern Queensland by the launch company Gilmore Space Technologies. Since 2021, Gilmore Space has been working to make the Bowen Orbital Spaceport a possibility by working with local contractors to build it and gain approval from the indigenous Juru people whose land it's on. After all this time, on March 6th, the license was finally granted by Ed Husick, the Minister for Industry and Science under the Federal Space Act of 2018. Gilmore Space plans to launch its first Eris Block 1 rocket on its maiden flight in the coming weeks from this launch site pending regulatory approval. When this happens, it'll be the first ever launch of an orbital rocket out of Australia and made in Australia. Looking at you, Black Arrow. Just over a year after the ABL Space Systems RS-1 rocket made its ill-fated first test flight, the company is not far from trying again. That mission's failure, caused by an engine bay fire cutting out the controls to the engines at T plus 11 seconds, forced ABL to have to rebuild the launch pad system and upgrade the rocket's engine bay. 
A new RS-1 has been erected on the pad in Kodiak, and ABL has announced that pre-launch preparations are now underway. Prior to this, our friend Harry Stranger obtained satellite imagery showing RS-1 horizontal on the pad at Kodiak before it was erected. Given this, the second test flight must be planned for launch in the coming weeks. The original RS-1 had nine E-2 Carolox engines on the first stage, but two more have been added. The stage has also been stretched and therefore holds more propellant, bringing up the payload capacity of the rocket. However, the rocket must first make orbit, and ABL hopes this flight goes a whole lot better than the first. And now, let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week, we'll have the debut flight of Space One's Kairos rocket from Japan. The 16-minute launch window opens on March 9th at 2.01 UTC. Next week, we'll have yet another trio of Falcon 9 launches on the schedule, all launching Starlink satellites. The first will launch from Space Launch Complex 40 within a four-and-a-half-hour window that opens on March 10th at 23.03 UTC. Then we'll have the second one from Vandenberg within a four-and-a-half-hour window that opens on March 11th at 2.13 UTC. Right around that time, on March 11th, the Crew-7 mission is also expected to be coming to a close. Full details about the crew's return from the ISS are not clear just yet, and weather may also play a part in their return, but we'll be featuring that return in a future episode. Rocket Lab is on tap to launch its Electron rocket from New Zealand next month with the Owl Night Long mission. The 1 hour and 15 minute launch window opens on March 12th at 1400 UTC. The third Falcon 9 launch of the week is set to take place from Launch Complex 39A within a four and a half hour window that opens on March 13th at 2329 UTC. And of course, on March 14th, we're hoping to see the third launch of Starship. That's slated to happen within a two hour launch window opening at 12 o'clock UTC. We'll definitely be live for that one well ahead of time, and we'll also have our usual countdown to launch shows. So if you subscribe and turn on notifications, you'll be notified whenever we go live. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in Spaceflight.